the Austin Forum Upload, the podcast of the Austin Forum on technology and society. Every episode, we upload for you the expertise, insights, and opinions of thought leaders, innovators, and creators on topics at the intersection of technology and society. We'll cover pervasive and emerging technologies that are influencing and impacting our business, education, governments, research, and culture. I'm Jay. I'm Jessica. And I'm John. And we're the co-producers of the Austin Forum Upload. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Austin Forum Upload. I'm John Lockman, the Technology Director for the Austin Forum on Technology and Society. And I'm Jay Boisseau, the Executive Director and Founder, and I'm pleased to have with us our guest, Jim Prather, the President of Wavi Med. Jim, thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here, Jay, John. Thanks. Well, Jim, we're going to get right into it with some definitions here because we're talking about neurotech today, and we really want to define for our audience, you know, what that means, what you think that means. We just did another podcast with a company called NewFit. And Ramona gave us her definition, but they have a very different technology than yours. So maybe the definitions are different. So Jim, why don't you start with what your definition of neurotech is? Yeah. So neurotech to me has two ideas to it. One is kind of the concept of understanding the brain and what it does and what it is. And the other is taking to the next step, intervening, doing things, improving the brain. So um, I like to cut it along those two lines. Um, We are in the first, we are a measurement device. We look at the brain, we come up with uh, a great measurement of activity, correlate that, then we correlate that with disease sets or interventions or improvement type of activities that, uh, that go forward. So it's like having a scale on the floor. You, you wanna lose weight, you better darn have a way to measure you know, where you are now and where you're going. But what you're saying is it monitors the brain's conditions. It's up to other behaviors, treatments, supplements, decisions of of some type to improve the condition, but the level of improvement can be measured with this device as well. That's exactly right. So I wish we could show the device on a podcast. It's really unfortunate that our our audience can't see it. Yeah, I don't know quite how to describe it, but it does look like something that uh, it looks like a cross between a very high tech device and a toy. It's so beautiful. Um, Who designed it again, Jim? Um, well, we did a lot of design internally, um, but we're, bo- we're based out of Boulder, Colorado, which happens to be also where uh, the company Crocs is located. One of our founders, one of our board members and advisors was the founder of Crocs. And so the material, you know, don't put on your feet, but it does, and it's nice, squishy, and it's comfortable. Um, he had a great relationship or has a great relationship uh, with the Italian design firm Momo. They do the Ferrari um, so this, this is the Ferrari of headsets, by the way. So that's what we got going there. <laughs> I mean, you would still get weird looks walking down the street, wearing that headset. Yes, you would. We, you we might, actually, it might get a little envy though. So we did a South by one time and we had a guy actually walking down the street with it on just <laughs> people are asking him questions all day long. So it's okay. Kind of fun. Now we're already off track, but with South right. by coming back live next year, Jim, I need to wear one of these during South by. So, you know, Please let me wear one of these during South by next year. So we've got this cool looking camouflage one, and I think it'd be just the right headset size for you. We'll get that one for you. Is it you. An extra, that extra one? large for my huge noggin? It is a large. It's going to be a tight fit. But okay, I'll try it. Although I'm losing hair, so maybe it'll, you know, maybe, maybe it'll fit a little better. Fit, yeah. Fit better. Yeah. All right. Well, now we should probably get into actual neurotech and what it does. So why don't you tell us a little bit about Wavi Med and what Wavi Med as a company does in neurotech? Sure. Um, Wavi is a, it is a medical device. That headset that I showed you earlier is FDA cleared. Um, So when we do a scan, we're doing what's called an electroencephalogram, an EEG. Everybody knows what EKG is for the heart, measuring electrical impulses from that. This is doing it for the head. Um, This is technology that's been around for 400 years. This is not new stuff. Um, Mostly EEGs are used for measuring and for monitoring for things like epilepsy, seizures. Um, If you ever did a sleep apnea study, they'll wire you up and look at you and what kind of beta waves or theta waves or alpha waves you're achieving during sleep. Um, But the EEG has been around. Um, There's a lot of research associated with it. And so we conduct an EEG, very easy to use EEG. The headset is geared so that people will actually want to get one of these done because 
in the traditional EEG, it's not a fun experience. Um, I'm not going to say anything wrong with anybody, but John would have a worse hair day than you would, Jay, after an EEG. <laughs> Just gonna say that. That's all I'm saying. Um, and uh, thanks for that kind assessment so of our sorry, the, uh, hair coverage. Thank you. So we uh, we had to really make it easy to use, easy to conduct the scan. You don't have to be a, a med tech to do this. We can train people in a few hours to do it, but the information that comes from it is pretty phenomenal. We went through all the artifact in the data. We convert that through our algorithms into an easy to use one page report for the doctors or clinicians or the folks that are looking at those measurements. And then those are great measurements as a baseline just to see what happens as we were saying before, using other neuro tech type applications. If you wanted to improve your brain, you can have a nice baseline and see if it's improving uh, through whatever intervention you're doing. So that's pretty cool. So it's really a, an eye into the, the brain waves and how they're operating. Yeah. We, we, uh, we started with very heavy in the medical side, as you can imagine, um, about two years ago, we got pulled in, uh, to the whole biohacking community. So, uh, one of our advisors, uh, is, is, uh, David Asprey of Bulletproof Coffee, those guys. Um, oh, David yeah. Asprey wants everybody to live to about 150 years old. Um, he had a great saying. He said, listen, this is, we did a, a podcast with him and we actually did a scan during the podcast. He goes, this is, this is like the blood pressure cuff of the brain. And that's what we like to think of it as. If you went in for a physical and every year you'd expect to get maybe a blood drawn, you'd, you'd get your blood pressure looked at, you, you know, someone's going to have you stand up and do an eye chart and maybe a hearing test but there's not a lot we do for the brain um, on an ongoing regular basis. And that's really why we developed Wabi the way we did. We want this to become a standard for brain care in the future. So Jim, you mentioned the blood pressure cuff. I have one of those. Yeah. There's other devices, you know, blood tests. We, we think we either know or think we know what ranges we should be in on those kinds of things. And often they just measure on some of those devices are on a linear scale, essentially. So you want to be in this range between X and Y. Right. What does this measure exactly? And do we have the appropriate scales for knowing this is in a healthy range? This is in a you need this pandemic range to end range. You are depressed range. You are super happy range. I mean, how, how does it, what kind of measurement does it give you and, and how do we know how to calibrate those measurements? Yeah, that's a great question. The, um, there's a type of EEG we do, a measurement we do. It's a, um, what's called an evoked response. So while you have that headset on, we actually put some headphones on you and we have you listening to a series of beeps, like one beep every second for about four minutes long. Each beep is, you know, there's a common noise 200 times, but 40 times there's a very higher pitch noise, kind of like a do 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 on that oddball tone. We have you clicking a mouse button. So you're relaxed, you're, you know, just in an easy state and you're listening to those tones and clicking that mouse button every time you hear that higher pitch tone. But your brain is doing something at the same time. Your brain is listening to those, is trying to discern each one of those tones. And if there's, wait a minute, are you supposed to click the mouse button? Do you click the mouse button? And 200 times the answer is no. So you just start filtering that common tone. However, when you hit one of those 40 tones, those oddball tones, the system lights up. It says, oh my God, it's the higher tone. Hit the mouse, hit the mouse. And there's a lot of activity in the brain because you're evoking a response at that point. The two key measurements that we look at is the timing of hearing the tone going to the brain stem and then back out to the cortical area. Okay, so that round trip is usually around 300 milliseconds, right? And so that measurement of speed and then how, let's call it the power of it hitting that skull. So um, we measure that in microvolts uh, are the two key measurements we get from our test. Brain speed, brain voltage. We happen to also click, you know, when you're clicking a mouse, do a physical reaction time too, but that's different. That's a different speed than what your brain is doing. So it sounds like you've created this kind of high resolution brainwave reader. What do you think we can do with this? That type of, uh, that type of uh, measurement has been around since the 60s. So again, a lot of research on it. And they've correlated that research, first and foremost, going back to your question, Jay, 
they correlate that research to our age. In other words, what is the rate? I don't want to get measured to one of the athletes out there that we measure. I mean, <laughs> no desire whatsoever. I want old guys like me that I'm measuring against. Um, so we have reference ranges for those measurements. Again, physical reaction time, brain speed, brain voltage. Um, but they have done just literally thousands of studies to correlate those same numbers to things like Alzheimer's, dementia, mild cognitive impairment. Uh, we've done a four-year study with the University of Colorado on concussion. And what does the concussed brain look like? Uh, measuring, taking those three measurements, uh, pre-season pre, you know, pre at a baseline, concussion, and then return to play, and then postseason. And we saw amazing correlation to a recovered brain, a healed brain, as well as a concussed brain. So injury, illness, and intervention, the three eyes are kind of the things that there's a lot of information on, and we can then correlate those measurements to. And then I assume the interpretation of the results are used by a medical practitioner who, while this device can't actually change anything about you, it's just monitoring, but the changes in the readings over time are the guidance to the medical practitioner for the advice they give you to uh, pr promote healing and, and uh, address ailments and things like that. Is that right? That's exactly right. Um, because of the FDA requirements and everything else, and any device like this is not quote unquote diagnostic. Diagnos diagnosis for all those things really relies on the doctor, the, the MD. Right. Um, but we want to put much more information, you know, into their utility belt to be able to say, all right, well, that's what this is. And then watch as we improve uh, the brain through their interventions. So we get pulled in a lot of very interesting interventions because we're just the measurement device, right? We're agnostic. Um, is there any home use? Like if I had one of these, you know, I have a, I have a blood pressure cuff. So I, 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 and I can read online to know things that I should do to address blood pressure, just as a doctor can prescribe medication for it. There's behaviors I can do at home. If somebody had one of these at home, are, are there circumstances, measurements and results and such and guidance for what they could do to improve their own brain health? Or is it really just used by medical practitioners right now? Um, we our primary, I mean, there will be, let me put it this way. Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Um, but there will be. And then I think, um, on the on go, it's the continued simplification, just like anything else. How do you continually simplify and make easy, not only the ability to do something, but the ability to understand what you just did to yourself. Um, but right now we just are trying to get it to the point where this is not a all day affair at a, at a lab or a shop. It's something that could be done in the home. We actually have done many, many scans in the home, but we have a tech doing it right now. So it is mobile, it's portable, but right now we wanna make sure those scans are done correctly. Uh, so we, we, uh, we don't ship out a kit for you to do a scan and then send you your information. We're not 23 and me yet, so. <laughs> Not, not quite that deep. How did you get, how did you get into this kind of business? Yeah. Um, my background is finance accounting. I was a Deloitte guy and then I ran companies and I was actually in the software side. One of the key things I did is I got out of the corporate world working for places like Mindscape and Mattel and learning company is I went and started companies. The first one was a business intelligence software company. So the idea of taking lots of crazy data, pulling together, making sense of it was a huge thing for me, both in my previous life and in the companies I did. I sold that company. And when I did, one of my friends approached me and said, hey, I'm going to do this brain scan company. <laughs> um, he's one of my friends from college. We didn't realize how smart he was, but he's uh, actually a PhD in astrophysics uh, from the University of Texas. Hey, and, I am too. <laughs> there we go. And uh <laughs> You know, with a concentration in neutrinos, you know, you, you always worry about what kind of conversations you're having. So when you talk about someone, you know, looking at quantum waves, well, I mean, we're basically looking at brain waves. Uh, the science is, is similar in, in, in some ways to that and understanding them is definitely. So um, when he started the company, I was one of the original investors. I didn't work for him then. That was 13 years ago. Um, but about six years ago, I, I joined the interest we had in it, besides just we thought it was a great idea and good good for uh, society and the like was, but 
I, you know, the other side of that is my family has a history, as I think all of us do, with people that are affected by brain injuries or brain illness, uh, including, you know, we've got a case of uh, Alzheimer's in our, in our family. My mom suffers from dementia. My wife has a mother that passed from Parkinson's. Um, I've had a lot of concussions, you know, from stupidity, really. Um, a lot of fun things, but, you know, when you knock yourself out to the point where you have retro amnesia, then, then my wife kind of got on me about that. Um, so we have a concern. We know that all those things play into what we're doing. So everything from, hey, I do not want American football to go away. So is there a way for us to play safe, uh, allow the brain to heal if it is injured? Well, let's come up with some way to measure that. Um, Alzheimer's is not something that's diagnosed until you're dead. I mean, that just seems crazy to me. So why can't we have especially through data and through all the AI capabilities and deep learning, understand what does the brain look like 20 years before you would get Alzheimer's? Because there are markers that AI can start picking up, we believe, uh, to help with that. And so it's got a really big side to it, um, as well as a very individual, because again, if you go to the doctor, the first thing he's going to ask to assess your brain, the main tool they have is a, is a question or assessment. How do you feel? Right. I feel good one day, I feel terrible the next. <laughs> so, you know, what is it, you know, let's give him some more information to be able to work with. But the, the brain and the mind is a very personal thing to a lot of people, I would imagine. I hope so. so <laughs> I mean, how, how has the reception been from other people on this kind of tech? And do you yeah. see any change in that right now? Well, I'll tell you the first question I measured, I probably measured as many people in the company as anybody else that I'm kind of the lowest common denominator because I'm not medical. And, you know, now I, I understand all this stuff really well, but it, uh, I've run a bunch of scans. The first thing when we talk about doing a scan is people say, well, uh, I don't know if you're going to see anything up there. Right. <laughs> or they're worried that it's a measurement of intelligence, which it is not. It is brain activity. And so if I can get through those first two questions, um, <laughs> People love it. I mean, they absolutely love it. They get to see their brain for the first time. It's really cool. And, you know, you're, we, we take them through the scan. They're watching this whole thing the whole, you know, during the whole scan so they can really see kind of the impact of it. So you can see clearly differences between people who have not had a concussion and who have, I assume. Again, so that's a diagnosis. And as, as someone, I can't say that, but I can tell you that there is definitely correlations on a brain that's been injured. And I've seen that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have you seen correlations? I'll try to choose my yeah, words. That's pretty good. Thanks. <laughs> have you seen correlations with people uh, due to more transient conditions, depression, oh, yeah. uh, addiction, things like that? Great, great question. We, uh, we absolutely have. Um, there's a concept called quantitative EEG or QEEG, which starts looking at the actual brain waves. So not just these measurements of speed and voltage like we were talking about. When you start getting into those kind of measurements, you're also able to look at different, um, how that correlates to different ailments, mental health, behavioral health type issues. So in that one page that we provide, um, in addition to the three measurements I mentioned before, we have two measurements. One is related to mood we can call it depression, anxiety, and one is related to attention, specifically uh, a high correlation, high sensitivity, specificity to ADHD. And so you're getting a pretty darn good look at your brain and what goes on both in terms of, you know, your behavioral health or mental health, as well as, uh, as the brain, uh, brain activity levels. I, I really wish I'd had one of these during this whole pandemic because Absolutely. there've been so many articles written about mental health and your mental state during this that you can't not be aware of it if you're a curious person. And so I've been more acutely aware of my mental state in the last must be 14 months now than I was before, but I had no way to, to even get any kind of measurement of that other than how do I feel today? So I look forward to these devices being more, more common and the interpretations of the data being more common. So I can begin to, to use it to know, Oh, well, I need to pick me up today. Maybe I need to call my daughter. Maybe I need to call my, my family or something, or um, maybe I need to go out and exercise or something. 
Yeah, you know, people talk about that intervention side, and I we've seen a lot. And in the end, we we did a full boat study with a, a cardiovascular interventionalist in uh, Denver, a guy named Dr. Jeffrey Boone. He's a fabulous individual, but he was doing these great things for everything, kind of the neck down. And as people went through his protocols and his improvements, uh, people all of a sudden were not. He, you know, none of his patients were getting dementia or Alzheimer's. All were staying relatively healthy um, from the neck up. He just didn't have, didn't have a way of measuring it. So mm. five years ago, we partnered with him and he found, he found us. And um, we started measuring his patients pre, post. And as they improved their cardiovascular system, all those brain measurements were improving as well. And, um, <laughs> you know, we do know that Listen, if you can get the dopamine levels up, if you improve the oxygen and oxygenation, boy, let me say that three times, uh, to the brain, um, that brain cells are given and you give it the right food. Okay. You're not starving yourself. You're not doing crazy things. Um, if you give it the right food, the right diet, all those things, guess what? You're going to create new brain cells. It's beautiful. Brain is a wonderful organ. And so things like behavioral health. Well, listen, if I'm out exercising, guess what I do? I'm improving my oxygen levels. I'm improving blood flow. And guess what? I less likely to be depressed. You know, it's just interesting how all of it is still very holistic, you know? So Jim, I have to ask, we're recording this with John and I in Austin, Texas, and there's a different, you know, neurotech company that's gotten some acclaim there. Their founders moved other businesses here and opened job positions for his neurotech company here. And that one involves more of the drilling into the brain and some yeah, things yeah, like that. Not. What do you think about these kinds of uh, technologies? So, you know, yours is very passive monitoring, but how close do you think we are to um, neurotech that can actually have a direct impact and an active impact on brain function? I think... I think we're a lot closer than we think, than we understand. Um, embedding things into our brain is already happening. It's not like it's new. Um, you know, maybe it's experimental, maybe we don't know about it, but it's happening. Um, things like stimulation can, we know there's different stimulations to the brain that can help with depression, PTSD patients. Uh, we know that deep stimulation can help with Parkinson's patients to relieve some of the tremors and the like. We, we've been seen that. So now it's like anything else. How do we make it easier? How do we make it implantable? How do we make it so it's not, uh, you know, doing things that are, are wrong for the brain? Um, the thing we're doing is doing massive measurements, which those same measurements are what Mr. Musk is going to be using. <laughs> you know, it's the same kind of information that's coming out of the systems that he's developing. I'm just not putting holes in people's head. Um, so do I think it's close? Oh, yeah. I think we'll see in our lifetime some amazing things being done, especially around things like pain and depression and, and uh, other things that are already being solved with really large machines. And it's just like anything else, like a Dell, let's shrink it, shrink it, shrink it, and make it something that is a lot easier to, to haul around. So it seems like the, the tech has really come along, like you'd mentioned earlier, you know, the the EGG has been along for a long time, but we didn't really understand it. And we're kind of getting to that understanding now. And maybe we're getting better at the, the actual treatment of not just reading it, but, but injecting some sort of help to the brain and really understanding an organ that we really don't know very much about. What's your vision for the next 5, 10, 20 years? Where do you want to see this go? Well, I mean, I can tell you what we want for Wavi, and it's going to have an impact on all the other neurotech out there. Because I said, we're not in this side of it, the intervention side. Um, I'm not, I put that thing on and I'm not stimulating your brain. There is no electricity <laughs> going this way, okay? Um, but if you had an easy way to quickly gather data and identify what you need to do for that brain, that's, that's where we play. Um, and then the other side of it is, uh, although we love our device, the software is beautiful, reports are great information, we know that the bigger play is the data side. Um, we have over 25,000 brain scans in our database already, and we're already doing AI work on it with people like Charlie Burgoyne and the Valkyrie guys are we're working with them. And 
Um, we have our own internal group that's spinning it up as well as a few others. Uh, really cool story is um, we just, uh, one of our, our strategists is uh, suffers from chronic fatigue from fibromyalgia. And so we worked with a group out in Arizona and combined it with, uh, they're working with Harvard and California, the three different groups. Uh, they look at people with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue, very hard to diagnose. And people feel very, you know, it's a kind of get put in a box if you have it. And, um, and yet it's very real for them. And so we spun the data up. It was pretty cool. And we had a control and then we had, you know, 70, 75 other people that had suffered from those diseases. And you get this very cool looking 3D, you know, eigen map that shows, hey, clustering over here, very tight clustering for those with and those without. And so if we can start doing that for these other difficult disease sets, then we can start, you know, identifying and doing interventions that are going to be much more effective. Because is there a difference between CF and fibromyalgia? Yeah. Well, how do you treat either one of them, even though they may manifest itself symptomatically as I'm tired, I go through, you know, periods where I need to rest, so on and so forth. This is cool. So it's data. I think for us, five, you know, not even five years from now, we're going to be doing some very cool things on the AI side, including, and this is where I think it's really interesting. Imagine doing a scan, easy to do in the doctor's office, the doctor, you start complaining about certain things. Let's say you did have chronic fatigue and said, oh, well, hang on, let's push your data through this algorithm and just see how far you are on that scale and have an answer, answer instantaneously. Now we're getting to, to some really cool health care, you know, that's going to be fun stuff to do. So I'm, I'm super excited to hear your optimism about the short time scales over which we'll expect to see rapid evolution in these neurotech capabilities. Um, what about the, the great hope, the augmented intelligence? Do you see neurotech contributing to that in our lifetimes? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I do actually. Um, you know, we are already working with some of the top doctors on the stem cell side. So we work with uh, uh, Dr. Madera here. She's awesome. Marcella Madera, uh, Dr. Womack. Um, Madera did a full boat stem cell treatment on David Asprey, including his brain. I mean, so is his brain quote unquote augmented or is it just healing itself quicker? Is that a person that's got a super skill versus me? You know, <laughs> you're, you're Wolverine. You can recur and regenerate. You know what I'm saying? You really are getting to those points where is that the superhuman side of it? And then the other side of it is even on the measurement side that we're doing, what does the perfect airline pilot look like? What does the right, the perfect right-handed pitcher in the major league, what does his brain look like? What does, I mean, it's all this digital twin stuff, right? I'm yeah. creating a digital twin of the best, you know, sniper in the army. And I want to help other people get that type of brain. So they're most able to do some of those skill sets. And so are we seeing that stuff? Absolutely. That's going on. That's happening. Uh, now, what are they doing interventionally to make that brain get there? I mean, you've talked to plenty of people that do everything from hyperbaric chamber, mindfulness, uh, things related to, uh, you know, uh, nutraceuticals and drugs and the like. Um, all that is happening. The question is just how effective are they? Um, you know, neurocognitive tests where you're doing very interesting thing, hitting, hitting, hitting things on the wall so that all of a sudden you have a faster reaction time than the next guy. And guess what? You can play your keyboards better than the next guy. Are you, it's pretty interesting. Um, so I don't know, is the 150 year old guy with a very fresh brain a better than the 75 year old guy that's going to die here soon? I don't know. You know, that you, now you're talking about a quality of life and, and some other questions that are going to be pretty interesting to start answer. Well, you're giving me lots of hope about the future and I'm an optimistic person in general, but I, I know that we have lots of unanswered questions about neuroscience and as a, as a basic science, and then about how these technologies will help enhance it. How can our listeners, we'll close with this, Jim, how can our listeners 
learn more about this field, your company, sure. um, and what they might, you know, be able to do to help. Yeah, that's great. Great. Um, I mean, obviously, there's so many books about the brain out there that are really good. Find one that's easy to read so you can understand it. And I think we like to say that we're trying to let people take control of their health. So getting in better information and understanding it is a key part of that. Um, get a scan, get a, get a scan like what we're talking about. Um, Wabi is, is probably the only device that's doing kind of the broad range that we're doing, but there's places in Austin that you could get, get a brain scan without a problem, Wabi scan. Um, and then I would say, you know, what you can help is the big thing for us is we want to take a few key areas of medicine and take them the next step. Longevity, aging is one of them. And the other side is sport. We like sports from the viewpoint of safety as well as performance. We kind of talked about performance at the end there. Um, and the more we can do, more data we can gather, the more we can build on that for a really good future, I think. Fantastic. Thank you very much for joining us, Jim. I look forward to talking to you again in the future sometime. I hope we can get you maybe down to Austin for South by Southwest in person next year. And especially yep. with an extra cap for me to wear walking around South by Southwest for a few days. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Thank Jim. You, I appreciate you guys. Thanks for listening to the Austin Forum Upload. You can listen to additional episodes and check out a schedule of our monthly in-person events at austinforum.org. The Upload is a production of the Austin Forum on Technology and Society, a nonprofit organization here in Austin, Texas.